Um, so, uh, what I thought I'd do is I'd take you very quickly through the state of the British uh, nuclear weapons system, where we are, and the debate. And those are two different things completely. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of these interesting disturbances in the force, uh, and then what the probable outcomes, possible outcomes are uh, over the next 15 to 20 years. Um, <clears throat> I, I asked Avner last night when I was staying with him why Israel has nuclear weapons and uh, it's a question that I ask myself a lot about Britain um, uh, because it's a question you have to ask yourself if you, if you ever want something to shift. You actually have to focus in the first place on why things are the way they are otherwise you're wasting your time. Uh, it, it, it's what um, a group of academics in Harvard describe as the immunity to change in a system. If you've got any system at all that's uh, established, it has a number of different complex forces that keep it going. Uh, it's what a systems thinker would describe as negative feedback loops. Um, if, a, if, a, if a system continues, if it gets shaken, because uh, every system un undergoes shocks, shocks. Uh, if, if it's got these negative feedback loops, the shocks hit it out of, out of alignment, then it comes back again. And, and, and that, that applies to your personal life, it applies to organisations, it applies to states. And uh, so if a state like Britain or Israel has nuclear weapons, uh, there, there are a whole set of reasons why that is. And it doesn't actually help very much to give an alternative perspective and say, look, this is how it should be. Because if you try and just say this is how it should be, um, those negative feedback loops will hit in and take it back to its original situ situation. Um, a good example I have <coughs> is uh, New Year's resolutions. Um, when you set a New Year's resolution, I'm going to give up smoking. I really want to give up smoking. I want to give up smoking because I want to be healthy. I, I don't like the impact it has on other people and the judgment they have and all the rest of it. You know, that's focusing on being a non-smoker. But, if you, but what you actually have to do is to focus on the reasons why you're a smoker. I, I, take, I have a fag because it makes me relax, because I feel like I, I deserve something, it's a treat. All these, all these positive things about being a smoker, these are the feedback loops that get, keep you being a smoker. Uh, and, then you, and then what you have to do is you have to actually assess the, that commitment to being a smoker and the assumptions underneath it and then how you might start to relax them or, or replace them by other things. And, and, and this is the immunity to change thing that I'm, I'm exploring around the British nuclear system. What is it that makes us a nuclear arms state and why do we want to be that? And then start to relax or, or replace those, those things with other things that are more constructive, less costly, less dangerous. Anyway, <clears throat> the reason why Britain is a nuclear arms arm state is primarily because of the status it gives us and because uh, it brings us closer to you guys. Um, you know, when you guys offer us your very best military system uh, and we have a shared, res a, a shared ability to field that military system, then it gives us the sense that somehow we're special. That's really important, it's really important to us. I set up a, <coughs> a commission populated by people in the British establishment. And we looked at these questions. And it, it, over three years, meeting quite regularly. And one of the strongest, perhaps the strongest thing I came away from that experience was the awareness of this relationship being at the heart of why Britain has nuclear weapons. And it always has been. <clears throat> you know, Britain decided to acquire nuclear weapons uh, after we were shut out of the Manhattan Project after the Second World War because we felt that we needed them in order to gain respect from Washington. It was nothing to do with the Soviet Union. We knew we, knew we were never going to face the Soviet Union alone, and we know today we will never face Russia alone. We, we have to create this illusion that we might at some stage face people alone, but in the end, actually, we don't believe it. Right. Really right. <clears throat> there's a lot. There's a lot of similarities between Britain and Israel. <laughs> anyway, um, it's very much, and it's been an elite issue as well. There's always been a public debate in Britain. It's probably the most vigorous public debate 
on the planet when it comes to any nuclear arms state. You know, should we or should we not have nuclear weapons? But one thing not ever to get drawn into is this idea that that public debate has anything to do at all with the decisions to acquire nuclear weapons or to keep them or the new systems. I mean, one example would be the election in the early 1960s when the Labour Party <coughs> had an explicit policy of unilateral nuclear disarmament. It won the election and then the new Labour, president, new Labour Prime Minister just carried on business as usual and, and acquired the next nuclear weapon system. Uh, <coughs> in the 1940s, in the first decision to acquire nuclear weapons, uh, the, uh, the cabinet meeting uh, that was held that uh, made that decision, it, it was explicitly on the basis that this, was, this needed to have a, a British flag on it, uh, that we couldn't afford for Britain to not have a nuclear weapon when other major powers in the world had them. This was not about being threatened, it was about status. And Blair, Tony Blair in his memoirs, describes the decision made in 2006-07 uh, on the basis that, on balance, the arguments for and against were very, very finely tuned. In fact, even he himself was not convinced one way or the other, except he felt he couldn't be the Prime Minister that was sitting there making the decision that would then mean Britain really was no longer a player in the world. So it's status and its relationship with the United States. And um, so, you know, it got me thinking, um, how about, you know, with the British American Security Information Council, what about if we were to trigger a discussion in Washington, which would then say, actually, we're a bit neutral about whether you guys have nuclear weapons or not. In fact, there are good arguments for saying from the American perspective, it's better if the Brits don't have them. Because, you know, if the Brits and the Israelis, the two closest allies to Washington, can't trust the Americans enough to sit under the nuclear umbrella, then what does that say about any other countries? And I was, I was using that argument in Washington in order to create a bit of ambiguity and perhaps to, perhaps to give the impression that it would be better from an extended deterrence perspective. If, if, we, if we started to actually reduce the number of nuclear armed states in the world, starting with the closest allies, because that would demonstrate a bit more confidence than we have at the moment. Well, there were two problems with that strategy. One, one was... It, <laughs> it went down with a lead balloon, like a lead balloon, you know. You know but they're our closest friends, of course we want them to have nuclear weapons. Uh, these things are not logical. Um, but secondly, because even if it did work, and if people in Washington did start saying, actually, you know, it would be better for us if the Brits and the Israelis didn't have nuclear weapons, <coughs> then that would actually only play into the hands of those in London and Tel Aviv who would say, well, you know, of course the Americans don't want us to have nuclear weapons because then we would be second class allies. So. <coughs> So it, it's really problematic, this strategy stuff. It doesn't really always work as clearly as you want. Um, <clears throat> but let me go, because I wanted to spend most of the time on the public debate. And the reason for this is because, on the one hand, I mean, it, well, several reasons. One is because you probably study the elite debate more uh, in, in places like this, because you know, you, you think in terms of leadership and you think in terms of the decision makers and you're getting into the minds of the decision makers because they're the ones who are making the decisions by definition. But I, but I, I wanted to talk about the public, public debate. And secondly, the reason for it is because people, people don't recognise that underneath it, it, there, there is this linkage, but it's not a linkage that uh, is... is is what it seems on the surface. And you need to understand the public, public debate first to understand how it does link and how it doesn't. So, <clears throat> the British public debate goes back to the 1960s when, uh, when there were massive demonstrations. And these demonstrations were, uh, arose from a mixture of a significant elite uh, academic elite who uh, saw the folly of the Cold War 
and a deep fear in the general, pub the general public. And that sort of alliance between the academic elite and the general public created this, this protest based on morality and, and a number of other dimensions. But, but as I said, it, it was divorced from the actual decisions. Created great spectacles, but there was no real sense that this movement was going to succeed. Uh, we had a second wave uh, of protests in the 1980s, uh, again, partly out of fear because Reagan was hyping up the Cold War uh, rhetoric and uh, the, the Soviets were, were really very seriously concerned that there was going to be a nuclear exchange. I don't know if any of you have seen um, Deutschland 83. It's a great series if you do get to see it uh, coming out of Germany. Uh, but it, it, it really gives a good sense of the, the genuine fear that even the general public were aware of, but people inside the system were aware of just how close we were to, to, to an exchange uh, around Abel Archer. Uh, so there were massive demonstrations, and again, bigger in Britain than probably anywhere else, uh, that had a number of dimensions around Britain's acquisition of Trident and uh, the placing of cruise missiles in in. Uh, the UK. Then we have a third wave. Now the third wave has been very different <clears throat> from the first two. The first two were, were mass movement protests. The third wave was, um, how can I put it, it was an artificial one uh, that was created specifically by Tony Blair for his own domestic purposes. <clears throat> uh, Tony Blair was Prime Minister up until uh, July 2007 and before he left uh, office he wanted to um, he, he wanted to reinforce and immortalize the transition that he had achieved within the Labour Party the, the Labour Party being the left-wing party leftish sort of wing party uh, in Britain uh, and he had transformed the Labour Party into being electable and attractive to uh, Middle England. And Trident was an incredibly useful symbol. If you leave this institution having learned nothing else but this, it will have been worthwhile. Nuclear weapons are always about symbols. Symbols about other things. And in this instance, nuclear weapons are a are a symbol about Labour's electability. If Labour has a policy of being anti-nuclear, it is unelectable. And I was explaining this to Geoffrey over coffee, but let me put it simply. Imagine one elector. This now, this elector is somebody who is left-leaning, who is who is deeply uh, into their own living their own lives, uh, who has reasonably liberal viewpoint, who thinks that nuclear weapons are dangerous and that the world would be better off without them. They may even think, actually, Britain doesn't need nuclear weapons. Uh, it will be perfectly safe without them, and if we could save a lot of money. So this elector is would be classed as a unilateralist. So if they were stopped in the street by a pollster and said, do you believe in nuclear weapons or not? No, I don't believe in nuclear weapons. Do you think Britain should get rid of nuclear weapons? Mm, no, yes, I think Britain should get rid of nuclear weapons. Do you think Britain should get rid of nuclear weapons and with the money spend it all on schools and hospitals? Yes, I definitely think Britain should. Now, you know, and, and that, that last question attracts 70% support within Britain. If, Labour Part, if the Labour Party were to get in power, with a policy of unilateral nuclear disarmament and get rid of Britain's nuclear weapons, how would you feel? Oh, not sure about that. And not, not because they don't agree with the policy, but because a party that is about disarmament, unilateral disarmament, is a party that is weak. And a party that is weak is not a party that is about being strong when it comes to leadership. It's not a party that I can trust in the world which is nasty, brutish, brutish and requires, you know, re requires strong leadership. So, so there's a real problem here for people who want to achieve a change of policy because the electors don't believe in it. 
even with the opinion polls that you see within Britain today, which are roughly half and half until you add the economic question and the schools and hospitals, in which case it's a significant majority in favour. So anyway, back to my story, Tony Blair. Why, why, why did he want to create this, this opportunity? He wanted to destroy the unilateral association, unilateralist association of the Labour Party once and for all. Not because he was passionately pro-nuclear. He says in his, in his memoirs that it was roughly balanced, but because he wanted to destroy the left in the Labour Party and ensure that Labour was once and for all an electable party of government. And this was a symbolic way of doing it. So he published his white paper uh, outlining his decision, and he took this decision to Parliament in May, in March 2007. Unheard of. The British, this, this is not a democratic decision. Previous governments, prime ministers haven't even shared the decision with their cabinet. They haven't had the trust in their fellow politicians. Now he's, he's actually taking this, this, this decision to Parliament. And why is he doing that? It's because he wanted to have a showdown, and he wanted to win, and he wanted to rub the unilateralist nose in it. And he's, he succeeded to an extent. But some of us saw this coming, because it, it's, it was quite an obvious strategy. So rather than argue against it, we talked about, we, we had a strategy of uh, it's not the right time for the decision. Uh, it's unnecessary. The Trident submarines have, had only been patrolling for less than a decade, and they had a life expectancy of 25, 30 years. Why did we need to rush into this decision? It was quite clear that this was a decision about Tony Blair's legacy and about this political objective. So that was what we focused on. We didn't, we didn't adopt the ground that he had chosen. We adopted a different ground. And that has been a very successful strategy up to now. It's probably one of the most successful political strategy decisions I've, I've made in my whole career. <laughs> because we've been proven right since. Who is we? <clears throat> uh, it's the, uh, how can I describe it? Uh, the NGOs based in London, small group of us, who were strategizing in, 19, in, in 2004 or 5 in advance of this decision. And we decided that we were going to fight this on the ground of delay. And the, the vote in the House of Commons was not on whether to go forward or not, but was on whether to delay this decision by another five to ten years. And actually, they delayed the decision by more than the time that we were advocating at the time. So uh, when, um, when this passed through Parliament in March 2007, they were looking at an in-service date of the first submarine of 2024. The new government comes in in 2010, so Labour loses the election, Conservative Lib Dem coalition, they decide to delay the programme by five years. Um, there's been another delay uh, about six months ago, by another five, six, <coughs> seven years, they're being quite vague about it now. So they've now delayed it over 10 years. When they made the decision in 2006, they were looking at an in-service in date of 17 years from then. We're now looking at an in-service date of 17 years from today. So technically, we were proven right, uh, but that wasn't the reason why we were up putting the argument. <coughs> so, uh, let me see, I've lost my track. Um, the decision, by the Labour government in 2007 was also opposed from the inside, but in a very uh, subtle way. There, were, there was the Foreign Secretary and the Defence Secretary who were very uncomfortable with this decision, uh, the way it was being put forward in, in, uh, at the beginning. Uh, the Defence Secretary at the time is now the Vice President of MTI in Washington, the Nuclear Threat Initiative, uh, Des, Des Brown. And he said, when he was told that his job was to steer this decision through Parliament, he said, I need to have this as a balanced decision. If we're going to go forward, we need to also give with the other hand. We need to reduce warheads or we need to do other things. He was told by his officials that he couldn't reduce warheads. We have a policy of minimum nuclear deterrence. Now, what does that mean? It means minimum. 
if you go lower than that, then it's below minimum, right? So he said, well, what does minimum stand for? So he had a confidential briefing about the number of warheads it required to attack Moscow and a few other cities, which is relevant. It will come to relevance later when I talk about another report. Uh, <clears throat> And he looked at this, and uh, of course it was way above his head when it came to the technical side, but he said, I want to reduce the number of warheads. Uh, and they said, it's not possible. 200 is what we need. He said, I want a report on my desk in two weeks' time that will take us down to 160. <clears throat> I'm telling you this in detail because it's a really interesting case study of how politicians' minds work and why he's now sitting in Washington as the vice president of the Nuclear Threat Initiative. <clears throat> Two weeks later, um, he gets a report. This is how we can do it with 160 warheads. Okay. So it's not technical at all. It's back of the envelope stuff. It's full of uncertainty. And what is painted by the officials as a deeply technical and complex set of calculations is nothing of a sort. It's just finger in the air, 160 works. When, he, when <laughs> Labour lost power, in 2010, and the Conservatives came in. The Conservatives, more right-wing, Liberal Democrats meant to be centre. Within a few days of the new government coming in, they decided to cut the number of warheads from 160 to 120. At that moment, Des Brown became an anti-nuclear activist. Not because he's deeply anti-nuclear, but because he's so pissed off with the officials that they came back with this answer, oh, 160 is absolute minimum, and then his political opponents are able, as uh, a brush of a hand, to go lower, that, that he now sees the whole system as corrupt. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a deeply motivating, <laughs> I mean, don't underestimate, it's a deeply motivating thing. These things are about emotions, about being, uh, about being uh, lied to, or you think of being lied to, that it's, it's about your eyes being open, your blinkers being taken off, and, and realizing that there's, there's a whole load of uncertainties here. There's a whole load of myths that drive these decisions. And, uh, and this is your own narrative, right? This is not the official narrative that he will tell us. He will sit with him, he will not tell the story. That he just he would not tell the story in exactly the same words, but he would tell the story. He would tell no, you. No, he told it went to 120, but he not the way you told it. He won't tell you that that's why he's sitting in Washington today. Oh, I'm not talking about that. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about his opposition. He would not describe yes. it. Yes, he would. You think? Yes. He would tell you that story. He's quite open about that. And, and he's also quite open about a number of other parallel stories about being told things that then came, came to be proven false. Another one being the timeline that I was telling you about before. So, Des and I debated head to head at the Royal United Services Institute in February 2007. The Royal United Services Institute is the, is the um, think tank in London that is the closest thing to the armed forces that we, that we have. So it's deeply part of the British establishment. And they invited me to sit on this panel with Des Brown as the Secretary of State for Defence and two other pro-Trident people. And they expected me to, to argue an anti-Trident position and to be demolished in front of 200 people from the armed forces and the defence industry. And I, I accepted the challenge and then I ducked it because I didn't argue that Trident was something that we didn't need. I argued that the time was wrong and that this was about Tony Blair's legacy, as I was telling you about, and about the industrial drumbeat. The need for the British industry to have the business if it was going to carry on in the business. And that's not a good reason to be spending all this money. So, um, so we had this head-to-head, -head, and afterwards, at the end of it, Des Brown, and, and I argued about the delay, and he said, you know, I haven't heard that argument before, and I'm now starting to doubt that we're in the right place. And then, and then, as I say, the moment the Conservatives came in, they not only cut the number of warheads, but they then also agreed to a delay within a few months of, of another five years. And, and again, it, it led to a lot of his sense of 
disaffection with, with the establishment. I'm getting into a lot of detail here. <clears throat> I'm going to move on to the present day or just before. We had an election <clears throat> exactly a year ago and uh, before that election <clears throat> we had a Conservative Liberal Democrat uh, co coalition and all the opinion polls were, demo were, were showing a likely hung parliament again. Now, the way the British uh, system works is that we elect our members of parliament and then the Prime Minister is selected by the MPs. So, the, generally speaking, the party with the largest number of MPs or that can, can, co can, can create a coalition uh, sufficient to um, have a majority of MPs then has the position of Prime Minister. And uh, it looked at the time that it would be hung, a uh, hung parliament, and it looked at the time that our most likely Prime Minister would be uh, the Labour leader, Ed, Ed, Ed Miliband, and that he would have to create a, a coalition. Now, <clears throat> at the time, the Scottish Nationalists looked as, it, looked as if they were going to win quite a few seats, and that he would be dependent on them. Scottish Nationalists have been heavily anti trident Now, let me just give you a minute or two on this, because this is also an interesting dynamic, which you just don't have here. The Scottish nationalists are deeply anti-trident. The Scottish public opinion is generally anti-trident. Uh, uh, but you have to ask why that is. Is there something particularly Scottish about being, uh, about being an internationalist, about you know, be, n not liking nuclear weapons or, 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 or what? Or actually is it more to do with a legacy here, a path-dependent process where over the last 20 to 30 years, those in Scotland who have been wanting Scotland to secede from the rest of the United Kingdom have seen this as a really useful way of trying to convince their fellow Scots that people who make the decisions about Scotland are all based in London. Okay, so there's several thousand jobs dependent upon the upon the base that is in Scotland. We base all our submarines out of Sc this, this base in Scotland. Uh, but there's five, six million people that live in Scotland. Okay. Those five, six million people minus the few thousand uh, can be convinced that uh, they are now target number one. Anybody that wants to attack Britain and get rid of our nuclear weapons, they'll be going to Scotland at first, and not only that, but the base is within shouting distance of Glasgow, the largest city in Scotland. So what does that say about the way in which the Scots are treated by the rest of the UK? It means that they're expendable, it means that they're second-class citizens. You, you get the drift. You know, this is not just about being anti-nuclear, it's about the way London treats Scotland. So again, comes back to this point, nuclear weapons about symbols. There are plenty of people in the Scottish Nationalist Party and in Scotland as a whole who are on principle anti-nuclear. But there's a deeper thing here, deeper commitment, competing commitment, that's not competing, deeper commitment to Scottish independence by that party and they use this as a symbol for something deeper. So, <clears throat> so the Scottish Nationalist anti-trident, Ed Miliband in public is pro-trident because that makes sense electorally for the reasons I was talking about earlier. But in I know in his heart of hearts he's anti-nuclear, and I know that because his closest political advisor on a whole host of issues, particularly foreign policy, is one of my best friends. And we align up with a, a strategy that that talks about not getting rid of trident but about further delay. And the, the ducks are all in place. The election's going to happen. He's going to become Prime Minister. Part of the negotiations there is going to be about trying. It's going to be about delay. And of course, the election doesn't go that way. Conservatives get a majority. I start thinking about getting a new job. <coughs> I'm serious. Because <laughs> uh, I thought that was the end of it. And then, and then, there's, um, and then there's an interesting twist to the tale over the next few months. <clears throat> uh, the, he resigns as 
leader of the Labour Party, and there is a, a leadership election. And in the process, Jeremy Corbyn becomes leader of the Labour Party. Now, Jeremy Corbyn is anti-nuclear, absolutely to his core. There is nothing that will ever persuade Jeremy Corbyn to be the leader of a political party that will be explicitly pro-Trident. So he is on a mission. He is a campaigner. He, he, he is a righteous campaigner. And uh, we now have a deep split within the Labour Party that will be a split come what may. So this, this, is, this is an interesting question. Um, is this a good or a bad thing from the point of view of somebody like me who's debated the last quarter of a century to try to change the British po political position on, on trade? The, 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 the main party of opposition is, is, is on a move to review its defence policy and that there are other parties as well that are starting to look again at their policy. I, I, was, I was advising the Liberal Democrat, which is the, the middle ground party, I was advising their defence committee a week or two back about what their policy should be. Uh, and, um, and I said they shouldn't be anti-nuclear. Um, that, that would be counterproductive to my position. Now, in, on, on that table, they, those people sitting around that table, there were unilateral nuclear disarmers, there were people who were passionately in, in favour of nuclear weapons, and there were people in between. And, and they didn't, couldn't understand why me, as an avid anti-nuclear person, would be advising them not to come out in favour of unilateral nuclear disarmament. Uh, I think Corbyn's position as leader of the Labour Party is deeply problematic for anti-nuclear uh, activist strategists like me because the problem in British politics on this issue is that it has been incredibly polarised and it has all been about symbolism. If you are anti-nuclear, then you are not to be trusted with being a, a responsible leader. If you are pro-nuclear, you are responsible, you are the type of person that makes difficult decisions. They may be immoral, but that only reinforces the sense that you are prepared to make these difficult decisions on behalf of the people that elected you. Because that is the deeper, most fundamental nature of what it means to be a leader and to be representing your state. So. So there's some deep shifts that need to happen before a country like Britain, let alone a country like the United States, seriously starts to think about changing its policy in this, in this area. So why is it that I'm advising the Liberal Democrats not uh, to be advocating nuclear disarmament on behalf of Britain? And, and, and the reason for that is because if the Liberal Democrats join Labour as anti-nuclear. They will just be uh, sidelined and pigeonholed as, as a party that's not serious about power. And it's, it's, it's winning, from my perspective, it's winning the battle and losing the war. Because the war, if that's the right word, I, I, I just mean by war, I mean the long-term game, right? <laughs> um, the war is about changing attitudes and it's bigger than nuclear weapons. It's about moving us towards a world where domestic electorates and where leaderships and where states interact in a way that isn't about simply disarming or, uh, or um, responding to the latest aggression from the other state. It's about understanding things at a much deeper level than that. And this is why places like this are so important. Um, I was going to talk about vulnerability. I want, yeah, okay, case study. So I'm sitting there after the election. I'm seeing Jeremy Corbyn being elected uh, as leader of the Labour Party. I'm in even more difficult position. Things are becoming even more polarised. What do I do? What do I do? Well, um, I think it was Einstein that, that once said, or was it, no, it's somebody, 
can't remember who it was. If, 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 you, if things are not working for you, then, then it, it, it's the sign of madness to carry on doing the same thing. And, and so rather than, um, rather than carry on with the strategy, I, I took a step back and I thought, so <clears throat> how can we shift so that, um, so that I'm speaking to people who don't agree with me uh, in a way that's effective? So, you know, I've been using arguments about, um, about the need for global governance. So I've been using arguments about Britain playing a role in, in, in moving nuclear armed states towards a more cooperative arrangement. Some of that has worked. You know, De Des Brown, for, his, uh, for all, all the positive things he's done, one of the most positive, I think, was setting up the so-called P5 process, the, the, meeting, the regular meetings of nuclear weapon states. Uh, where they can meet together and talk about about doctrine, they can talk about transparency and other issues. I mean, it's extraordinary that they weren't meeting together before that. Um, Des Brown now condemns his own uh, um, his own initiative. Uh, he says that this is a meeting of the nuclear armed states and that creates a cabal. But I I disagree with him. I think it was a positive thing. Uh, but <coughs> but these arguments don't actually get you any closer. <coughs> to the shift that's required for people to, to, to really move. And so I, I, I started to think, well, what is it about the commitment to nuclear weapons and particularly about the commitment to the Trident system that people feel so strongly about uh, in a positive way? And, and, and in the end, I, I, I settled on the idea that this is a nuclear weapon system that is invulnerable and that is an assured second strike capability. And there's a certain way in which that, that makes sense. It, it resonates with people. You know, in a world of chaos and difficulty, at least we can strike them back when they hit us. You know, we're not we're not going to we're not going to use this first, because you know, we're 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 trustworthy, we're mature people. <laughs> we're British, you know. We, we we play by the rules, we're cricket, you know, all that kind of stuff. And and but but in the end, you know, they know we can strike them. So this is what's so beautiful about us. So how can I, sh how can I, how can I kind of start to undermine this? And I settled on the idea that Trident is not reliable. How, how could Trident not be reliable? You know, a D5 missile is the most, the mo the, 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 the most uh, reliable missile system that the U that the US has ever developed. You know, it's never failed a test, or maybe it's one, one test, two tests out of. Many, many, many. It has very high success. Very high. I mean, compared to any other weapon system, very high. And um, I, I, and it makes sense logically. You know, put them in a submarine, it, it can it can disappear. I, I started looking. I mean, I I've I'd, I'd had some awareness that there was some holes in this, but I started looking at this, uh, t uh, emerging technologies, and it started to become clear to me that there was a very powerful narrative here that was that may even be true. <laughs> well, it, it, well, there is there is definitely some truth in it, um, and that is that that um, the navies, uh, particularly the U.S. Navy, but also the Chinese Navy, have been looking, investing a lot of uh, of uh, R and D recently in unmanned underwater vehicles. Um, and there's a good reason for this, uh, because unmanned underwater vehicles can go for a long period of time, many months, without any intervention. Uh, they have been looking a lot at the uh, communications and the detection systems underwater, and there are serious limitations to, to this underwater, because electromagnetic waves don't travel well underwater. But acoustic signals do, and there's been a number of significant developments around active uh, acoustic detection systems that mean that um, there is a significant chance, if enough money is invested in these systems, that you could get you could start to achieve transparency in the oceans. And so what I what I've done is collaborating with a couple of other NGOs in. in Britain, I, I've invited a number of scientists who are not involved in the military side, but are involved in civil applications of this technology. 
And there's one in particular from MIT who, who came to London and gave this presentation about how he'd been using active acoustic si si systems, which were relatively cheap compared to anything the military could throw, to look at shoals of fish. And it was an incredible demonstration because over a space of thousands of miles uh, radius uh, in the um, Bay of Maine, he could demonstrate by adjusting the frequency, he could detect pretty much any object in the sea, uh, including uh, this pipe that he'd put uh, several hundred miles away from the source. Now, if you can do that with shoals of fish and with pipes, you can do it with a submarine that is several hundred, well, uh, yeah, several hundred feet long. And uh, this is a real problem. If you're relying for your nuclear weapon system upon one submarine out in the ocean that is undetectable. If the, uh, if the submarine becomes detectable, then it doesn't become a second strike capability. In fact, worse than that, if we start to get into a crisis situation, it's even worse than putting your ICBMs on your home line because it's in international waters and your submarine becomes vulnerable. And if your opponent has a way of taking out or neutralizing your submarine, that's your whole nuclear deterrent bomb right at the start of the crisis. So we're in that, as a country, we're facing the choice of investing uh, capital cost now has reached somewhere in the region of $60 billion uh, and rising in a system that may not work. And that resonates with people who are pro-nuclear weapons. So now, this is, so now the debate has shifted. It's been, this, this, this issue has been picked up by the defence spokesperson of the Labour Party who has been tasked with reviewing the party's policy and she's made it quite a public issue. And, and we're developing the technical backup to the question. Now, bearing in mind this is, this is now, I, I, I made the joke earlier about it, it may be not be true. It may not be true, but it's just a question mark. And that's all it needs to be in order for people to start to go, hmm, maybe this is not as black and white an issue as we thought it was. And that's my objective as a tiny little NGO in the big C, is to create question marks and to get people to think again. Because the old arguments don't get them to think again but bringing in new ones like this do. So we have a vote in Parliament uh, because the Conservative Party has learned from Tony Blair's uh, example that votes in Parliament work very well, thank you very much, because they have a good, nice majority in Parliament for nuclear weapons. More than that, from the Conservative government's perspective, this is deeply useful. We are... We are we are facing a referendum on Britain's membership of the European Union uh, that's happening in the next few weeks. Now, whatever happens with that referendum, the Conservative Party is tearing itself apart. This is disastrous from the government's perspective, but it was inevitable. It's the Prime Minister playing a very high-risk strategy to try and shore up a deep problem in his own party. <coughs> but whatever happens, there's going to be problems afterwards because these people have to kiss and make up and carry on governing the country. <clears throat> what better way of doing this than then soon afterwards having a vote where the Conservative Party is pretty united and the main opposition party is deeply divided. The, the, the attention starts to shift, right? So, <clears throat> but, but do they have the vote soon after the referendum? In which case, this then becomes a non-issue because you have you have the joy of the immediate satisfaction, but then you lose the benefit of your opposition being divided over an extended period of time. Not only that, but you have the, the opposition party who are in the middle of a review, and therefore your the, the the opposition MPs are are being given the freedom to vote the way they want to. So there'll be a bit of problems for the Labour Party, but it won't be that problematic. They'll go and they'll vote the way they want to, and then the issue will be done and dusted. If they wait until Labour sort themselves out, 
and by that I mean destroy themselves, at the next conference, which is in September, where this policy will come, whatever, whatever the leadership comes up with, and I've been advising the, <coughs> the uh, defence spokesperson quite a lot, particularly about these vulnerabilities, but whatever advice she comes up with that then comes to the conference for a vote, there's going to be blood on the floor. And then after that, worse, even worse, the party will have a policy. And the party will have a policy which they'll then take into the Commons of the vote, and then people, MPs will vote against that policy, whichever way that is. And then there'll be, there'll be all sorts of political fallout from that situation. Look at this from the point of view of the government. This is wonderful. So they don't want to take this to Parliament until way after that. In fact, the longer they leave it, the more the Labour Party destroy themselves over this issue. So I predict that this will be an issue that will run and run. They may not even, they promised to have this as a vote on Commons this year. I think it might be next year, it may even be the year after. Because this, this, is, this is gold dust to, to the Conservative Party. Meanwhile, I'll be talking up this vulnerability issue and I'll be shaking people's faith in this being a, uh, a system that is invulnerable and is perfect. And just before I finish, I want to give you a bit of an anecdote, because a, a, a mutual friend of ours, <coughs> who is a Liberal Democrat, um, has... Uh, Do you want to keep this person anonymous? Yes. Oh, OK. No. <laughs> <laughs> this person gave a... Uh, Toby gave a talk here. Hmm. This right. very room. <clears throat> OK. There we go. So Toby, um, Toby, who is a former targeter for the Royal Air Force, has come up with an alternative system that based on the, the idea of the F-35 and the B-61-12 bomb, which is Britain shifts from, being, from basing itself on Trident to basing itself on the F-35. Um, and there are lots of pros and cons to this argument from a military perspective. But I think it's beautiful from a political perspective, and hence I've published a couple of his reports and and have. Uh, so what do you propose to move from missile to from to move from Trident mm -hmm. D5 uh, on submarines mm -hmm. to F35s and B61 12s? Mm -hmm. So to go back to aircraft, to go back to aircraft based both on Britain and on aircraft carriers. Mm -hmm. The aircraft carriers. Is a complete. Uh, How many you have red now? Hmm? How many aircraft carrier you have now? Uh, we one have none, one. but we will have <laughs> one, maybe two. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll build two, but we may only end up with one because we'll mothball one, mm -hmm. and we'll have one sailing around for five, six years, and then they might well, they might have aircraft on after that. Oh, don't laugh. It's not any like <laughs> rational or <laughs> defense planning. Uh, anyway. <laughs> The point being is that the aircraft carrier is a complete red herring because there are no targets that would require an aircraft carrier because there's only one target that matters, and that's the Russians. And we could reach them with the F-35s with a bit of refueling in uh, over air allied territory. So he's done all his targeting and his st strategy. It, it sort of makes sense from a military perspective. And, and the number is 160? No, no, uh, probably with... 120, same as currently. Yeah. And with most of the aircraft being knocked out, but delivering enough nuclear warheads to make it a viable deterrent. But the beauty of it is not whether it works militarily, the beauty of it is politically, because the British government will never adopt this system. But it raises the question, why are we so committed to Trident? Why are we so committed to this particular system? And in the end, it has to do with the fact that it's the best you've got. And if you're sharing it with us, then that demonstrates that we're allies that can be depended upon. It doesn't make sense logically. It's an emotional argument. And that's what really makes sense. Anyway, I'll, I'll finish with that, at least with the rabbiting on.